years ago, the rabbi won a award for writing from the city of Haifa in Israel. Next to me was another two authors. One is Rabbi Rabinowitz, and the other one is uh, Simcha Raz. Simcha Raz is a prolific Israeli author. One of his famous manuscripts is the story of Rabbi Arya Levine. Rabbi Arya Levine was a well-known chaplain at the early part of the Etzel, pre-state of Israel. And the story goes that a woman came before him and said that she's a aguna, she's deserted, her husband left her, and she wants to be released and no one can find him. So Rabbi Arya <coughs> asked her to show him pictures and after examining all those different pictures, Rabbi Arya said, let me try my best. And he spent an arduous effort going from one room to another in a jail, in a big British jail, try to see if any one of these Jewish prisoners look familiar to that picture. Lo and behold, one day, he noticed a guy that looked very familiar to that um, picture. So Rabbi Arya asked him and said, are you so and so? <clears throat> and obviously the guy denied it. So Rabbi Levin said to the, um, the head of the prisoner, I'm going to bring the Torah and I'm going to read to them on Monday and Thursday. And they, uh, they said, fine, I'll be here in the morning on Monday and I'm going to read. So he came there with a small Torah and then while he was leading the service, he turned around and he said, Ya Amod, and he called upon, with the place packed with prisoners, the guy on the very back. The guy was not expecting to be called. He says, okay, what is your name? The Hebrew name. And your uh, father's Hebrew name, and lo and behold, by mistake, that guy was caught. The, um, <clears throat> the idea that the rabbis try so hard to um, uh, release those um, women in crisis, those uh, situation of uh, deserted wife, is a mission that all of us, all of my colleagues and myself would dedicate ourselves, try to help. And the Talmud tried to go, as we explained in the past, to a very extra mile by accepting witnesses that usually we do not ex upon expect or um, um, by any means say that it's fine in the rabbinic court. Uh, it can be one witness, it can be a idolater, etc., as we explained in the past. So today, what we're going to discuss among many painful subjects is the subject of one witness. The scenario is the uh, husband disappear, one witness claimed that he saw him dead, if you accepted that, and how far you go. Um, if you have some motivation, if you're involved with um, um, somebody paid something to him to say it, etc. Another scenario we're going to discuss again, it's painful reality of life. It's the idea that um, two sisters, one married to a fellow and the other one wished to be married to him and it's a lot of jealousy between them and the, um, the wife and the sister went to, let's say, to Kathmandu, to Nepal. And several weeks later, <coughs> excuse me, the sister of the wife came back and she uh, attended a bedding session and she said that her sister is no longer among the living. The question is, is this something that we accepted in the face value or not? Um, Another scenario we're going to discuss today is the um, issue of who takes precedence. It's painful to um, remember that story, but those of you who recall the Versailles crisis, it was a very big wedding hall in Jerusalem that unfortunately the engineers for all kinds of reasons not to do the structural engineer properly. And as a result, at the middle of the um, wedding um, ceremony, the floor collapsed and um, many people get killed from both. It was two weddings, one on the top of the other. 
So imagine a scenario as a wife that you have a husband and one and only one son and she receives a phone call that the husband and the son get killed and she rushed to that place and um, she met one of the Hatsala, one of the people who are rescue guys and he was very um, clear and he said you know what makes a difference she was screaming she wants to know who passed away first if the son or the husband so either because he was under pressure or because that's the way he thought he told her <coughs> excuse me that the the son passed away first and by uh, hearing so she went ahead and she married someone else the wedding took place and um, let's say two years later she have a son from the new husband and for sure she invited all these rescue people to come and partake of that big ceremony and while they have the speakers that giving Vartoa doing the um, um, breeze there are two guys that come up from the rescue different guys and naturally they're speaking about that crisis and they said that the husband passed first and then several minutes later the son passed now the question is do you take these marriages invalid or at least if you validate the marriage can you uh, legitimize the child who um, at the face value <coughs> excuse me look like a mamzer a illegitimate another painful scenario i told you in advance is going to be a lot of painful realities um, um, if a husband provided a get to his wife, a bill of divorce, but he conditioned it. For example, he said, here's the get with condition that you cannot marry anybody forever. Does that have an effect or not? Especially, even you tell me that it doesn't have an effect, can she go ahead if he passed away after bringing this get and marry a Kohen, a priest? So as you see, there are many a scenario and we are on page 93b 18 lines from the top of the page Rabbi, Rabbi before we start I'm sorry yeah, um, okay. little little confusion on my part on the uh, on the part of the uh, the introduction you talk about a woman who um, whose husband and son were killed in the horrible tragedy in, in Yerushalayim um, now you said that uh, you know there was then a question of Mamzerut with the following marriage so was this a situation of Yibum then? Yeah, because Yibum. You, you didn't mention Yibum, Yibum and I just Yibum. wanted to make sure. Yes. So it was a situation yes. where she did marry the brother of yes. her ex yes. of her former yes. husband or yes. her past husband. Yes. Okay. Uh, Women have no children. The husband, for all kind of reasons, can be a conflict between husband and wife. He ran away. And he left her alone, can't find him. And one day, someone came and said, I saw him, for example, in uh, Italy. And I um, saw that he was drowning. Uh, we went to, uh, to um, school dive or whatever, one of those sports, and he drowned. Now, she needs to do a levy right marriage, she needs to do a yibum. Now, the question is, if you have Ed Echad, if you have only one witness that testified before the heir that the husband is dead and is no children, can she take his word in a face value and have a yibum? Why? Because we mentioned in the past several days the most lenient part that the rabbis hold is the issue of leniency when it's come to uh, Aginut, when it's the deserted wife. So we said at Neeman that we trusted him. Now the idea is why we trusted him. We have an assumption in accord that something that the person can be caught, meaning something that he said today, that he clearly knew that here they're going to find out, <coughs> excuse me, find out 
it may take time, but they find out that he's lying. These type of things, in a usual manner, people don't uh, commit it. People don't do that. Um, uh, <coughs> number two, the So this is one side of the quandary. The other side of the predicament is Odil matama de edechad mishum de ihi daika uminasva. The haha kevan de zinin de rahama ale lo daika uminasva. We have an assumption that if she's go ahead and marry by one witness, it's because that we have an assumption that she will not rush to marry someone else before she make proper uh, research. The idea is that we, in a way, release her, but expecting her to make a deeply, as we said yesterday, and full investigation to make sure that she's not falling in any trap of being married as a married woman. Now, <laughs> the problem here, since she knows the brother-in-law, and she knows him for many, many years. So we assume that she will, she will not take in a serious consideration, she will not <laughs> <coughs> spend the proper considering time of searching deeply in the whole situation of the death of her husband. She just take it as is, run out and marry his brother. So here the issue of Nehmanu, the trust that we have with one witness on distrust, it's a problem with Skolin Ivrit, Negi'a Ishit, which means she has some personal attachment to the brother. And because, um, imagine since she married to this fellow, she said all the time, oh, I made such a terrible mistake. <coughs> I should marry his brother. He is my man. I should be married to him, and for years and years that was her dream and imaginations. Now a fellow came and said, this husband who is a gambler, who knows, he went to Italy, and da -da -da -da, he drowned. She didn't even think twice, she rushed to marry the brother because she liked him a lot. She wants to be married to him a lot. So here we have this predicament, do we say, okay, we just take this one witness and we have the assumption that uh, one witness will not lie before of our being court and we accepted that or we said no we have to uh, go the other way around especially in the investigation not so much or only for her sake but mainly as we said with the issue of Mamzerut meaning the legitimacy of the union of the children that come out of that marriage so the Gemara responds Amalu Rav Sheshet Teni Tuha in order to elaborate on that, we need to search something we just studied yesterday. This is a Mishnah, page 92. Amru la bet nech, ve'achar kach met ba'alech, ve'nit yabma. That's the question that David asked. I'm just using it as an example. A Versailles, the wedding, just trace that scenario. A woman marry a man, have only one child. She receive a phone call, that wedding, she rushed there, um, she's broken hearted, and she's standing there before the rescue, and the rescue guy, after she's pushing him a lot, he said, yes, guess what, um, your son passed first, and two minutes later, your husband passed. And for sure, she's sitting Shiva, she's acting in a manner of mourning for a period of time, as we know, we have this uh, framework of three months, need to make sure that um, is not the pregnancy involved, etc. But <coughs> <coughs> the situation is, she, as a result of that, she went ahead and she uh, accepted the Levi White marriage by married to the surviving brother. And a year later, Mazal Tov, they have a son. And now they're thinking, what name should we give to that son? And she is uh, some type of act of appreciation. She called upon the Hatzala group, the group of, uh, of Mag and David Adom, right? The rescue people, and she invited them for the brief. And 
two people from that Hatzala come in and they deliver a Dvar Torah and while they're speaking they're speaking about the rescue and the crisis and everything and while they're speaking guess what they describe <coughs> how the husband passed away first and then they tried to rescue the son but unfortunately he passed away second so <laughs> The uh, broken-hearted now wife, um, she is uh, <laughs> fainting now in the, in the Ezra's nation, right? She's, she's totally uh, um, uh, broken-hearted because the Rachanim, the new baby, it's a uh, mamzer. It's uh, illegitimate. Why? Because she basically not skukali yibum. She doesn't have a yibum, um, any yibum bond to, her, to uh, the surviving brother. Why? Because that's Isu the writer, the Torah said that that's applied the mitzvah in general. Just to refresh the memory for those who are not familiar. We have in Leviticus 18 a list of abomination, and in that list we have the issue of the marrying with the um, wife of the brother, and vice versa. Right now, what happened? We have said in Deuteronomy 25 that if there is a union between the two and there's no children. And he's not surviving soul, in order to perpetuate the soul, it's a mitzvah, it's a commandment, it's a good deed upon the brother of the deceased to go ahead and marry the widow in order to perpetuate the soul of the deceased, as we read in the book of Genesis, the story of Yehudai, Judah, and Tamar. The, and the same we see in the Boaz and Ruth, in the book of Ruth. Now, the thing is here, um, because, again, because, she understand that the sun passed through first. She went ahead and did this matter of yibum, of levirate -like marriage. If she knows the, the opposite way, the truth, that the husband passed first, that's a total different story because if she's not zkukal yibum, then it's isu de oraita. It's a biblical negative commandment and uh, not, to, not to have a matter of yibum and she's basically should go out and marry whoever she wish to. So this is a one of those hard moments. Um, because let's just read it. So she must divorce from his brother. And the child that she uh, become pregnant before this uh, second testimony and the, the last one it's an uh, issue of uh, illegitimacy the mamzerim hechidami now we want to explain ileima trei utrei if it was two witnesses that came and testified in one way and then you have the second group the second team of two that came and said the opposite so imagine if you have one team of two came during that crisis when she came to that scene and testified and then you have the second one that came for the bridge as an example and contradicted the first one my chazit de samacht ahanei smoch ahanei how do you know that you can trust the second two more than the first two remember the first rescue said that the sun passed first the second one, year or two years later, said uh, the, the husband first. So basically that's called safek, that's total um, uh, predicament. So therefore, um, it may be um, that the second one is wrong. The odd, and furthermore, how, you ca how come you call that baby mamzer, illegitimate? The truth is, safek mamzer who? Mamzer meaning that you are defined by the absolute definition that this is a illegitimate child. Meaning if a normal case of married woman have a intercourse with another man and as a result of that union they have a child, that's definite Mamzer. Here you talk about a very complicated situation which is you have two groups one said that the son <coughs> excuse me, passed away first, another one said that the husband passed away first. It's total safek mamzeru. It's total unclear, ambiguous situation of illegitimacy. You may say that the Tana, the sage in the Mishnah, 
did not scrupulously check it in his language and he meant to say that that baby has a issue of safek mamzerut, which means maybe not legitimate. The Hamidiktani Seifa, if you look at the very last clause of the Mishnah, which is the third scenario, the third scenario speaks about a woman that was informed her husband passed away and she married to someone else. And then, as we said, the two witnesses came and testified that at that very moment he was alive, but he, it is true that he's dead, but that happened preceding the marriage of the second one. So they said, Harishon Mamzer, the first child that was born during the time of the living husband, he has an issue of Mamzerut. The second one is not. So the Tanah specifically talk about that case. Trace a situation that uh, uh, the um, uh, husband involved with the accident, God forbid, is in a state of coma. And every day when she visited him in a hospital, they said to her, the doctors, let's disconnect the respirator, it's no quality of life, why should we keep him like that, etc., etc. And she was sick and tired of that. And one day she said to them, do whatever you want. And she said, I don't want to hear from him, I'm away. She went away with the assumption that he's dead. And she met a man, and as a widow, fine, she married him, let's say in different state, in different country, and then they have a children. Here is the issue. If it turns later, much later on, that the real passing, the registered passing of the first husband happened, <coughs> happened excuse me, after she buried the second man, therefore the child that she was conceived, she was pregnant with the child at that period of time, that first child is Mamzer, it's illegitimate. Now you see here, that's the way the Tanah scrupulously understand the language of the Mishnah. El alav, so we derive from that, Shma mina chal. Here we have to go by the avenue that we accepted one witness. Now, to refresh our memory what we studied day before yesterday. One witness need bet din. One witness come, and this is a crucial, emotional, painful subject that not only affected her and her family, <coughs> but also affected the future generation. And therefore, we need the, the session of the Bet Din of the Rabbinic Court to testify, to accept him, and to release her to go ahead and marry. Two witnesses doesn't need the Bet Din, the merely fact that you have two kosher witnesses that come and testify before us, that's sufficient. So Rav Sheshit concluded here and said, Veta'ama, the reason that we rejected the witness of one person, it's not because the Atu Beitre Ak Hashuha, it's not because we have now the two guys that came after all. Remember the original scenario. The original scenario, when she came to Versailles, right, to that wedding hall, so one Hatzala guy, one guy told her that the son passed two minutes before the husband, and then later on, a year later, the other two came and <coughs> said the opposite. Halav Achi Meheman, which means as long as you not go to that motion, that the other two, the new two um, evidence from two new uh, witnesses that come and testify before us, who re totally rejected the notion of the first one, we hold, meaning in our system, in our mini court, we hold that the first witness, even if it's a one single person, we accepted him. And that's the notion he tried to prove. So we concluded from that Mishnah that one witness is sufficient for us to allow a woman to go ahead and have a levy right marriage with the surviving brother. Now, the Ika de Amri, you can go in a different avenue and say, Hati Bayelach, you can ask in regard to trust for one witness, the Afilu, Ihi Name Mehemna, meaning you can go to the next step. When it's come again to all this painful issue of Aginut, of releasing women, 
So it's not only the notion of accepting one single witness. Even she, meaning in a way she is subjective because she married to that man. But if she come before us and she said, my husband is no longer among the living, we accepted that. And she can go ahead and act in Levirate marriage, meaning she can marry his, bro uh, uh, his brother. Ditnan, this is something we're going to study on page 114b. Ha'isha she'amra met ba'ali. If she come and testify that my husband um, passed, and it means that, uh, for example, if they have children or he have no, no brothers, Tina say, we said that in order for her not to be aguna, not to be deserted wife, we accepted her witness in a face value and we said to her, okay, you can go ahead and marry whoever you wish since there's um, <coughs> no brothers. Met Bali, Titya Ben, the same matter, if it is a brother, she can do a Levite marriage. Kiti Ba'elach, the issue we have here is Le Mishre Yevama Le Alma. Here is a little deeper complicated issue that someone witnessed that that in-law, that that brother-in-law passed or the husband passed while the son was alive why we accepted one witness for that testimony that she can go ahead and marry you remember the notion we said earlier the issue that people who may get caught later. You take a David Cohen, you take a private detective, right? And you investigate it, and before you know it, right? Boom! They will reveal the truth. People, in our general assumption is, people will not lie before the court if they know that it's easy for us to find out the truth. That's the assumption we have. Hachanami lo meshaker. So here, to testify before Yevama that she allowed to marry anyone out, that's something that can be revealed, so that witness will not lie, or Dilma, or you may go the other way around. Tama de Edechad, the reason that we go by one witness, Mishun de Ihi Daika Uminasra, because we believe that she will go and make a very deep investigation before she marry someone else. Veha lo daika uminasva. But this woman will not make a deep search, as we explained earlier, before she marries someone else. The Miss Nahu, the reason here is the other way around, because she hated this Yavam, the Sanyale, she hated him so much, the brother in law, that if you allow her, she will not search much. She just go and marry anybody else because she wants to get rid of that brother-in-law. <coughs> Page 94, Amalu Rav Sheshet, Rav Sheshet responded and he said, Tnituha, in order for you to understand this concept in the Mishnah, let's dig in. Amrula met Baalich, ve'achar kach met Bnech. They inform her that your husband is no longer among the living, and proceeding to that, they heard that, uh, she heard that the, ha the son is gone. Then he said, by hearing so, she went ahead and she married outside of the family, someone from outside. Now is the issue that the second set of witnesses come and told her the other way around, meaning that the first the son passed and then the husband passed. Here you said, now, by force of circumstance, she needs to be released from the second husband. It's very painful. And the children, meaning the sons that were born, the first and the last, have an issue of mamzerut, meaning not legitimacy. Now let's understand. As we said earlier, if you have two set of witnesses, the first two testify that the husband passed first. The second one testified that the son passed first. Why do you trust the second one more than the first one? The odd 
ממזר, ספק ממזר, הוא the same question as we ask earlier. Why you call it a definite ממזר? It may be a something that it's in a bridge of may be illegitimacy. וכי תימה לא דק, if you tell me that, that it may be true, that it's only ספק ממזר, והם מדקטני סיפה, הראשון ממזר, והאחרון אינו ממזר, שמע מינא דווקא קטני. Because the last clause speaks about the first one, it's considering ממזר, and the, the, the last one is not, which means that the, the, the Tana speaks about total ממזר, אל עליו חד. You have to say again that we go by one witness, ותמה, דאתו ביתרי אחא חשוע, הלאו אחי מהימן, as long as you have two pair, two people that come in and challenge the first one, then you go in that direction. But as long as it's not, you allow matiri evamal ashuk, you allow her to go and marry just by one witness. So the Gemara rejected that and said, Le'olam, trey u trey, meaning we have to say that we not speak about one, but two pair of witnesses, the first pair and the second one contradicted the other. וכדי אמר רב אחא בר מניומי, בידי הזמה הכי נמי בידי הזמה. So it means you have a, a two witnesses that come and said one thing. And then the other two came and said, they didn't say the opposite. They just said, you guys are lying. You know why? Because we can testify that at that time you are in a different location. You are with us. in a different city or a different location, you are not there. So how dare you to give a testimony over something that you're not even there. Anyway, in order to extrapolate on this and understand it deeply, um, <coughs> we have to go to the mindset of all this um, notion, especially in patriarch marriage, which is, um, you have here a situation of woman that she needs to have a yibum, meaning a levirate marriage, again, married to the surviving brother of the late husband with no children. And she come before the bed and she said that the Yavam, the brother-in-law, passed. So we said we don't trust that witness, that, that um, testimony. It can be the other way around. Maybe it's a hate involved here. Amar le-Rav Mordechai le-Rav Ashi, v'amre le-Rav Acha le-Rav Ashi, Tashma, page 118b. We study, אין האישה נאמנת לומר, מת יבמי שאנסה לשוק, which is, um, she can come and say all kind of things for all kind of agenda, take the other way, ולא מת אחותי שיכנס לביתה. <laughs> Imagine a situation that there are uh, uh, two sisters, and one, one of them is, uh, let's call her name, like Rachel and Leah, and Rachel marry this fellow, let's call him name, David, and um, Leah all her life said, I wish to be married to him. He should be my husband. So Rachel and Leah went to Kathmandu, to Nepal, and now Leah comes and she said, my sister is dead, and I want you to prove me marrying to David. So we said that we don't accept that. And the idea is, the woman prohibited to the uh, husband of a sister uh, as long as the sister is alive. That's a biblical term. Now, um, <coughs> consequently, if she said that her sister is dead, we don't accept that witness, um, and she's prohibited to that uh, brother-in-law. Um, the reason for that is only in a case of deserted wife, Aguinut, we accepted witness like that. But other than that, we do not accept it. Um, because as we said, that people have an agenda, have a reason to testify in a certain way. We don't take her word. Wait a second. You tell me that her sister, we do not accept her witness. But if you have one witness, that come and said that um, the husband is dead, we do accept that. So we said, Veleta Michael Maseifa, Haish and Aish Neman Omar Metachisha Ebemetishto. A man cannot be trustworthy to say, My brother is dead in order for me to marry his wife. 
ולא מתה אשתי שעשה את אחותה. My wife is dead in order for me to marry her sister. Who knew the law מהימן? האל אחד מהימן. You see, a person himself who do not take his word, but one witness, one witness is, um, it, um, uh, we accept it. בישלמה גבי אישה, משום עיגונה אכילו בר רבנן. And that's a very important concept. We said that when it's come to הגינות, when it's come to issue of being deserted, being unable to marry and stuck and not have children, so the rabbis are more lenient to allow her to marry by one witness only. Ela gabei ish versus a man that doesn't have these rules of aginut, my ikale meima, because a dut bim kom erva, just a person give a witness, that's not sufficient to change the situation. Ela ki itzdrich, le rabi akiva itzdrich. Now we back to old business, where we go by the Rabbi Kiva view that he said, Sar kada tachamina. Ho'il ve'amar Rabbi Akiva yesh mamzer mechayavei lavin. Rabbi Akiva hold that when it's come to a negative commandment, biblical negative commandment, involved with act of cohabition between Yevama. So he said that we hold illegitimacy of the child that come out of that union. Eimai chasha akilkula v'daika. She is afraid, she is petrified that the child will be called mamzer, illegitimate. So therefore she is very, very careful um, before she marries someone and therefore we trusted her um, testimony. Kamash melan. So therefore the Tanakh come and teach us that even all of that, <coughs> it's still... You cannot take her um, uh, witness because maybe she do not dislike this Yavam and she will not be careful before she married someone out. So that's the way Rashi tells us. Rav Amal, Ed Echad Ne'eman Bi Vama. One witness, when it's come to Yibum, one witness is sufficient and therefore she can marry someone in the Shuk. Now we try to juxtapose two different biblical precepts. One is the Isuei Karet. Isuei Karet is when the Torah said, let's use the term, that soul shall be cut off. So therefore, when it's come to a woman, uh, give a testimony that the husband is passed, and she can go ahead and marry someone, that's involved Isu Karet Hitarta, because have relation with married woman, that's in a violation that's called karet. The Torah is very strong in the language. They use the term that soul shall be cut off. Le isur love versus allow yevama to go ahead and marry. That that's not in the same category. It's only, it's lenient. Is isur love. It's a negative commandment. But it's not in the term of karet. So therefore, lo kol sheken, how much so? But the term here, we have to understand the mindset. She hated this brother-in-law so badly that she was willing and ready to say anything and everything, including saying that he is dead. So we challenge that. Amar le'ahu merabanan le'rava. One of the wise sages responded to Rava and he said, He atzma tochia. You can testify her own view uh, uh, by rejecting all of that. Why? Because again, you have one witness said that the husband is dead. And you have the issue of Eshetish, of married women, which is a karet. The ilisu karet hitarta, leisu lav lo hitarta. As we said, love, it's a negative commandment, it's much lenient. So how much so that you can trust one witness? Ve'elahi, this yevama, this woman that need to be levy right, my tama lo mehemna. How come in that case you do not take her testimony? Again, this is a business of hatred. The Kevan de Zim de Sanyale, because she is hating this Yavam so badly. Lo daika uminasva. She is not scrupulous in checking the whole situation. She just wants to get out of that situation. El Echad Name is a one witness. We also have a concern. Kevan de Kevan de Zim de Sanyale de Sanyale lo daika uminasva because sometimes she carries such a bigotry such a hate against this fellow, this brother-in-law, so she will not bother to do a proper investigation 
before marrying to someone else and therefore in that case you cannot take one witness and allow her to marry. Now the conclusion of the Mishnah. זה מדרש דרש רבי אלעזר בן מתיה, ואישה גרושה מאישה ולא מאיש, שאינו אישה. So this is the last case of the Mishnah. Imagine a situation that, um, that um, a woman um, thought that her husband uh, passed, and she went ahead and she married, not married, I'm sorry, she received a ring, an engagement ring from someone. And they have Seudat so seen a special meal for the engagement. And guess who is one of the guests for the engagement? Give a guess, Elliot. Whom do you think? The husband came. The husband came. <laughs> now, <laughs> what do you do? So the new husband, this groom, needs to get back from her the ring. And she's not Mekudesh by any means. And she returned to the original husband. Why? Because the biblical term said that Eshet Ish, a married woman, cannot accept any manner of betrothed from anyone. So since she's not received a bill of divorce, she's not received a gift, so she's not a divorce. Amar Rav Yudah, Amar Rav, Havale Rabbi Lazar, Lemidrash Bey Marganita, Vedarash Bey Chaspa. He says, this is so obvious. Why you need to bother to go and tell me that that's the reason the Torah needs to specify this? It's something that people in general understand it by themselves. And my Marganitam, what type of pearl of diamond can be in this Pasuk that we should derive much deeper? The Tanya, the Torah said in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 7, Ve'isha lo yikachu. Right? A woman that divorced from her husband, they should not take. That's applied the law of the priest, the Kohanim. They cannot marry a divorcee. So they said, Afilu lo nitgarsha ela me'isha. Meaning, this guy is a little meshuga, right? He give a get to his wife, but while he give it to her, he is so whatever. He said to her, you will divorce now, but I'm giving you it under the condition that you will never be able to marry anybody else. So the halacha is that she is not mekudeshet, megureshet, which means she is not divorced, because the Torah required is a word in Torah, very deep and painful word. They use the word get kritut, karet. It's cut off. The bill of divorce has to express you taking the scissor and you cutting it totally. You get married to the first husband. Yeah, yeah, but it's a total cut, total separation. So therefore. Awesome. So the idea is, if the husband passed preceding that very bad incident, she cannot marry a Kohen. Remember, the Torah allow a regular mundane Kohen priest to marry a widow. Yet the Torah prohibited Kohen to marry a divorcee. But in this case, we call it the smell of the bill of divorce. Meaning, even the get, it's not an effective get, because the condition was impossible to be accepted. Yet, because that happened, and even preceding that incident, the husband passed, but this is what we derive from that pasuk, the isha grusha isha. Even he make that condition, that disvalidates the get, yet it's already knocked her out from Mary in the future, a Kohen. Now we go to the Mishnah. Again, very traumatic, painful story in this upcoming Mishnah. A wife went on vacation. She went to a, let's say, a different state, a different country, and for several days there is no interaction. Don't hear anything from her let's say, two weeks. And they think she's lost. No information. Then two witnesses came and said, she's dead. She has a sister. Her sister, let's call it Nechama, right? And this fellow have some comfort by marrying the sister right away. 
because the Torah prohibited a man to marry a sister only at the time of a living wife. But as long as by the Torah term, if the wife passed away, a person can go ahead and marry the surviving sister. So he married her. It's a beautiful chasana, right? Beautiful wedding. And guess who is the beautiful guest that comes for the Sheva Brochas? No, give a guess. The, 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 the wife. The, the wife, the wife the you're right. The, the, the so the this poor man, or whatever you call him, right? She's now disconnected from the newly wife, and he's back with his wife, right? Now, as far as Mary the Krovim, the relative of his wife, he can marry, meaning if the wife later on pass, he can marry, or they divorce, he can marry their relatives. And vice versa, because it's called betaut, it's all made by error. The same applied to her, she can marry to his relative. Now, meaning as long as his wife is alive, he cannot marry the sister. When the wife is gone, he can. Mi shalcha ishtol en dinat hayam bau vambu lo meta ishtecha. The first wife can come back and be together with him. 94 As we said, But if the wife passed, He can marry the sister. The same way as everyone can marry the sister of the wife, after the passing of his wife. And now, even in our situation that they have already cohabitation between the man and the sister of his wife, but as we said, that was out of the uh, mistake, not be'ilad znud. Amru lo meta ishto ve'nasa et achota. Ve'achal kach amru lo kayemet, ha'ita ve'meta, if the man was informed that his wife is gone and he married her sister, and then, later on, it turns that his wife is dead, but she wasn't dead at the time that they informed him. And meanwhile, the sister had a baby with him. So they said, The first baby is illegitimate because it's the prohibition, biblical prohibition, Leviticus 18, of Achotisha, the sister of the wife. But the last baby that was born preceding the passing, the definite passing of the wife, this one is not an issue of illegitimacy because it is already a time that she can go, the sister can go ahead and marry him. Rabbi Yossi disputed that. Rabbi Yossi omer kol she posel le de achrim, posel le de atzmo, ve kol she en posel le de achrim, ain no posel le de atzmo. So later on, page 95, we will go there. I just give you the abbreviation, the vignette of the view of Rabbi Yitzchak Nafcha, who said that if the, the sister of the wife um, was married originally to the brother-in-law, and the husband also went to that... Um, 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 uh, so you know what? Let's, let's wait another few minutes. We reach that, that mm -hmm. part. Please. Let's go to the Gemara. Very painful situation. Person have a terminally ill wife, very sick wife. Now, the husband of his sister-in-law, meaning her sister, husband, he is very much a scanner of we, he's involved with helping people, setting them. So he said, I know an expert overseas in Australia, and that expert um, in those uh, special uh, illnesses can do the surgery and help. So he, meaning the brother-in-law, flying with the wife, to Australia, setting her up for the medical treatment, etc., etc. And then the husband received a phone call that unfortunately both of them in a car accident passed away. Both meaning the, the wife and the brother-in-law. So here you see a new scenario. The married 
of the sister of his wife, um, it's a, it's bring the, good morning, Dr. Freeboy. So there are good news and bad news. In a sense, on one hand, we face crisis. The man went to Australia and the um, sister-in-law involved in a car accident. But listen how painful is the situation. They come back. Now let's analyze again the situation. A man, let's call him Reuven, he married Rivka. And unfortunately, Rivka turned very ill. And there is a special hospital, let's say in Australia, that can help. Now, Rivka has a sister. Her name is Dina. And Dina married a fellow named Avi. Avi is expert in this, he's helping people. Avi volunteer to take the wife of Reuven, Rivka, and fly with her to Australia. They both flew to Australia in order to find a, a, a proper medical treatment. And then Reuven received a phone call that was a terrible car accident. And both his wife Rivka and his brother-in-law both get killed. So he went ahead when they finished the Shiva and finished all the act of mourning. And he married her surviving sister, Dina. And the bad news is that all of a sudden, let's say, if one of them return or both of them return. So here we have an issue because as far as the mistaken marriage, we understand that it's all made in error with the assumption that the witnesses gave us a witnesses that, um, that was all in false for all kinds of reasons. Now, the marriage between Reuven and his wife's sister, it's in effect, um, in a sense that she is a married woman that have cohabitation with a stranger. But since the incident happened totally by erroneous information, um, we treated the case uh, with a great compassion. So as far as his wife, it's not prohibited to him. As far as his wife's sister, that's a problem. Now, here, the assumption we have here is we do not say, listen carefully, we do not say because the wife of his brother-in-law prohibited to his brother-in-law as a result of that false marriage, his wife prohibited to him. We do not say that. So, <clears throat> here, Leima Matnitin, the Loki Rabbi Akiva, the Irabi Akiva. Remember, the Rabbi Akiva notion was he hold that the moment that is the act of co uh, cohabitation, the children are illegitimate. So, here, if Rabbi Akiva was asked, and for sure that was after his passing. So the issue here, the Rabbi Akiva view will not allow the wife to return, meaning Rebecca cannot go back to Reuven. Havyale achot grushato, Rabbi Akiva treated as uh, the sister of his divorcee, which is when the woman returned from traveling far, far away, the husband by the rabbinic view needs to give a get to the sister of his wife and get is basically strengthen the idea that his, the wife's sister married to him. Remember the case we mentioned earlier with the two sisters that the sister was uh, in love with the husband of her sister and both of them flew to Kathmandu to Nepal and the sister returned and said that her sister passed and as a result, the husband married her mistakenly. So here we treat it as the sister of his divorcee, the Tanya. The writer tells us, Kol Anytime a person have an act of cohabitation, including cases which we mentioned of erroneous, uh, a man married to someone who's prohibited to him, ain't get. 
since the act of betrothal, the act of marriage was not in effect, so therefore they do not need to receive a get. There is one exception, which is the married woman. So imagine a situation, a man disappeared, and a witness, even one person, as we said, <coughs> excuse me, come before the Bedin and claim he saw him drowning and he's dead. We accepted that in a face value. She went ahead and married someone else, and then the husband came back. So we hold here that the, the rabbinic law, she needs to receive a get from the new one in order for her to go out and marry. In that sense, as we said the uh, day before yesterday, she needs a get from both, from the husband and the new one. But the reason for the new one, unlike the husband, that it's biblical, the new one is rabbinic in order for her to, to open the door to go ahead and marry someone else. So. The, one of the notions the rabbis have here, it's not only the cross-examination we mentioned earlier, but the idea that, uh, if you remember when we studied pages 88 and 89, uh, that um, the issue of the husband suddenly uh, come in and, and it was unknown, it was a mistake, people, as people, if you remember David asked me at that time that, uh, why do you care what people said? The problem is that when it's come to an um, issue of Mamzeru, the illegitimacy of the children, and the reputation of that woman, we want to make sure that people will not defame the character or bad mouth them or said bad things about them. People, when they see that she's, not, she's out of that second marriage without receiving a get from quote-unquote second husband, which is not a husband by any uh, legitimacy, as you said, but still, People consider that as a husband because it was a manner of marriage, it was a, a big ceremony, etc., etc. And therefore people may misconstrue it and think that the married woman can get out of the marriage without a get. So therefore, they, they add this to our uh, point, but Rabbi Akiva Mosif, Rabbi Akiva add to that, Af eshet ach v'achot isha. He add to that a, uh, in the list of Leviticus 18, also if a person married the wife of the brother or the sister of his wife again he married it by by merely witness of one person or merely witness of the bad deen that approve it meaning for example as we said um, if the two sisters went to Kathmandu and the sister claimed that her sister drowned uh, or, or went up on the Everest hill and, and passed and is no rescue team, and is no evidence, and is nothing. We have an issue to accept it, especially since we have an, an information or evidence that it was uh, her deep love to him or feeling toward him for years. Um, uh, especially if later on it turned that the sister was alive or even returned, um, she needs to receive from quote unquote husband, which is not a real husband, but in a sense since it was a mistaken ceremony of marriage, even the Kiddushin, the act of betrothal, is not an effective act. The Kevanda Amar Rabbi Akiva Ba'ayaget, and since Rabbi Akiva instructed us that when a person married the sister of his wife, and again, for those who just came in later, the idea of sister of a wife, the Torah tells us a person can marry a wife's sister as long as the wife is not alive. But if she was alive, it's an issue, okay? Now, when the person married the sister of his wife just by erroneous um, witness that gave uh, uh, wrong information, and as we explained earlier, if there is a children involved, we discuss the issue of legitimacy. So, for example, the case of the Mishnah, <coughs> when we have two sons, we say that the first one is illegitimate and the second one it is. Because if the wife was alive, or in the other case, the husband was alive, even it wasn't at the present. Remember the case of the uh, persons have a coma. Um, so, for example, if he is the first husband is in a coma, and, and she basically left the hospital, and she gave up hope, and he eventually passed, but it turns that at the time of her marrying another man, she was a married woman because he wasn't passing the way that she thought. And the witnesses came later on and proof that while she not only married but even pregnant with the first child, 
she, uh, the original husband was still alive, therefore we owe the mamzeru, the illegitimacy of that child, versus child that was born after the original sick husband passed, that we treated as a legitimate child. So now we try to juxtapose and match the point of Rabbi Akiva by saying, the love it marala. Is that true what Rabbi Akiva said? Amarav Gidl, Amarav Chia Bar Yosef, Amarav. Hai Eshetach, that example of the wife of a brother that Rabbi Akiva mentioned, Hey Chedani, give me a scenario. Kegon Shekidesh Achiv et Aisha. If, as we said, we di- differentiate between act of betrothal, which is the act of engagement, versus marriage. Betrothal, for example, especially in this country, they're giving a ring, uh, they make a, uh, a, a party or celebration or feast, etc. So he did not marry her yet. He just betrothed her. And he traveled to Afghanistan. And unfortunately, the brother then heard that the surviving brother, is he passed away childless. And then, as a result, it's a matter of levy right marriage. He went ahead and he married the wife, the surviving wife. And then his brother returned from Afghanistan. So this, we said since she's only betrothed to the first brother and not married him, Rabbi Akiva agreed upon that when he returned, she needs a get from the second brother because even the, the, it was <coughs> excuse me, erroneous marriage, it's still the Amre Inche, because people are stupid, people are, I'm sorry, people are not so familiar, and they see her married to his brother, second brother, and then they see the first brother here, they mix up everything. So therefore we require both gets. Hachkama, this one, Tnaavale Begirushim, Begirushim. He has a condition with the contract that if it's a retroactive manner, the high Shapir Nasib, and therefore the second one, he marry her properly. So it shouldn't have required a get, because the idea is that people who say that every married woman can get out of the marriage without get. So Rabbi Akiva rules here with a lot of sense, you require the get from the husband, the second one, the husband, even remember that it's not halakhically any effectiveness of the second marriage. The high achoti shanami, and it's also the sister of the wife. Hey chedami, give me an example. Kigon shekidesh et isha, meaning a person betrothed the first wife without married her, married her. The alchalim dinatayam, and she traveled overseas. The shama shemeta, and he heard that she's no longer among the living. As remember the case of Katmandu, I'm just using it as an example, right? Amad venasai tachota. So then he went ahead and he married the sister who, as we said, it turns that she was after him for years and all of a sudden the wife came back. So Rabbi Akiva, even in that case, required him to give a get to the wife or to the sister of his wife, the Amri Inche, because people see that she's married that one, and, and now they see the first one come back, and they may say, You know what this guy did? He has a stipulation, he has a, a special amendment to his ketubah. And you know what he had? He had this nigh, this condition, that, that, um, that uh, stipulates a certain circumstance, and as a result, retroactively, all this marriage was not in effect, and she was not a real wife of him. The Hashapir Nasib, and therefore he married correctly the second wife. And therefore, if again and again, if you let her go out without the get, the second one, people will misconstrue the whole idea of that marriage, even if it's not legitimate. And we basically juxtapose the two cases. Ella Nisuin, Mikal Memot Naaval Ben Nisuin. When it's come to marriage, you're going to tell me that there is a condition. We have a very clear-cut um, um, document. So Rabbi Akiva agreed that the sister in a matter of marriage does not need a get, and the wife is not considered the sister of the divorcee, and he agreed that the wife can return to the husband. If he, um, uh, you, you tell me that Mishnah followed the avenue of Rabbi Akiva, why did Mishnah mention only a case 
that a person heard of the passing of his wife and then he married his, her sister. Litnei namei chamoto, as you know, there is a concept of shniot larayot, what means that he is the closest relative and then the second degree of relative, which is rabbinic, that apply above the Torah said that the mother-in-law are prohibited, but we have also the mother of his wife, by having this witness, meaning, as we know, the Torah prohibited the relation between man and his mother-in-law, as an example, but if a person have act of cohabitation of his mother-in-law after the passing of his wife, so he is not receiving Srifa, which is one of the very strong forms of biblical commandment, right, biblical punishment, versus if that happened during the lifetime. Meaning, if a person is a married man, have cohabitation with his in-law, that's under the penalty of Srifa. If the wife passed, is still a violation, but it's not Srefa. So it means you may misconstrue and think that the person can marry his mother-in-law if the wife is no longer among the living. And again, when his wife returns, why you don't mention that case in comparison to the other? The Tanya. This is the text in the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 14. If a person, if ish, um, Meaning, if a person have a um, manner of betrothed between a wife and her mother, so they deserve srifa, otovet achad men. The Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Ishmael said either one of them. Rabbi Akiva said, otovet shten. Rabbi Akiva said that, that that punishment applies to all. And that's based on the study in Tractate Sanhedrin, page 76b, that goes to two different avenues to understand this disputation. Bishlam al de amar mashma'u dorshini kabenayu which means they have a question how to interpret the text. The Rabbi Ishmael Savar Chadaktiv, which is the punishment applies to one of them, meaning the man and either one, either the wife or the mother-in-law. Rabbi Kiva Savar Tarteiktiv, Rabbi Kiva Hall, that by understanding the text, it applies to both. Shafir, if the Rabbi tells me, that a person who cohabited with his mother-in-law after the passing of his wife, that this is the exclusion by Rabbi Akiva, so why the Mishnah did not speak about situation that a person married his mother-in-law by having a wrong witness that his wife passed and then his wife back. So Rav Kahana responded, which means, even according to the way Rabbi Akiva understand, the mother-in-law remained in that boundary of prohibition even after the passing of his wife. And therefore, he said that it's impossible for a person to marry his mother-in-law by having a witness that his wife passed. And again, we back to our question, why the Mishnah not mentioned that? So why, why we allow the wife for the first place to go back to him? We ask the question, because since her sister have a cohabitation with him in violation, even it was made by mistake, why you don't say in the same manner if a wife have a situation that the husband disappear and by mistake she marries someone else, for example, the Yavam, and then it turns that the husband is alive, she is prohibited to both, to her husband and the Yavam, why you don't say the same manner the other way around, right? It should be democracy, right? That, that if the wife, right? If the wife, the, the situation is the other way around, you should say that, that uh, right? That, that you say the same thing. So, lo dami. You say, so you cannot compare. Why? Ishto, his wife, di bemezid asira mi de oraita. Meaning, biblically true, if it was intentional, the Torah said that she is prohibited to her husband, that's a famous text in the um, in, um, uh, book of Bamibar, book of number chapter 5, and they said clearly um, uh, that after Venitma, after she was um, um, have a relation, Beshogeg, Gazru Rabbanan, but if it happens by mistake, the rabbis came in and put a another boundary, another decree. Page 95, <laughs> Even it was intentional, the Torah did not put a prohibition, so 
uh, when it's come to rabbinic decree, the rabbis did not say that his wife prohibited to him. Um, I wish to have more time. We just let's complete just the subject. Rambam Asir Tanya Ish Otash Chiva Osarta Men Shchiva Dachuta Osarta Sheachol Balodinu Uba Makom Sheba Al Isur Kan Esar Oser Makom Sheba Al Isur Chamu Balodin Shina Esar Oser Amar Abiud Al Nachelku Bet Shema Bet Yehuda Bebal Chamuto Sheposel Bishto Al Manachelku Bebal Achot Bishto Bet Shema Mim Posel Bet Shema Mim Lo Posel Tomorrow we'll continue with that. Shuloim, Malachai, Shuloim, Malachai.